We're halfway through the week. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Ijeon in Seoul. Coming up on today's edition of Business Daily. Korea's hiring strengthened in July with on-year gains in the number of employed above the 300,000 threshold for the sixth straight month. It's been about two weeks since the launch of the country's second internet-only lender, Cacao Bank. We take a look at what impact it has had on the country's financial market. These stories are more coming right up. Korea was the 11th largest economy in the world last year, maintaining the same ranking from the year before. Data from the World Bank shows Korea's gross domestic product stood at over 1.4 trillion U.S. dollars last year. The country's GDP per capita in purchasing power parity was little changed at slightly under $36,000 last year. The U.S. was once again ranked the world's largest economy with a GDP of $18.6 trillion, followed by China at nearly $11.2 trillion. The government released Korea's employment figures for July, an important barometer of whether the local economy is on a solid recovery track. And the numbers were mostly encouraging, although youth unemployment still remained high. Our Kim Hye-sung explains. According to Statistics Korea Wednesday, the number of people in Korea's workforce was up 310,000 in July compared to the same month last year, thanks to a pickup in the manufacturing sector. The manufacturing sector showed a turnaround starting June. The manufacturing workforce increased in July thanks to a base effect from last year and an increase in the exports of manufactured goods. The manufacturing sector posted 50,000 more jobs in July. Construction, education and real estate also added more jobs. On the other hand, services, including publications and information services, finance and insurance, saw the number of jobs drop. The employment rate increased slightly to 61.5 percent. The number of unemployed also fell below the 1 million mark in July, the first time in seven months. The unemployment rate stood at 3.5 percent, staying flat from the same period last year. But the youth unemployment rate increased slightly to 9.3 percent. With the number of young people who have given up looking for jobs and the number of job seekers both on the rise, the real unemployment rate for 15 to 29-year-olds, a key indicator of perceived job market conditions, now stands at over 22 percent. Kim hye Business Daily. The finance ministry says it's working on the government's budget proposal for next year to reflect the Moon administration's top policy goals. Now, to carry them out, it says billions of dollars are needed, hinting that it's necessary to carry out major restructuring and how it spends public money. Our Kim ji has this report. The government says it plans to fine-tune details of its 2018 budget proposal ahead of submission to the National Assembly by September 1st. Speaking at an economic meeting on Wednesday, Finance Minister Kim dong yeon said the proposal will focus on job creation and welfare policies while slashing infrastructure-related investments. He hinted the way public money is spent will change going forward, with some 9.7 billion U.S. dollars worth of government expenditures due to be restructured, some $2 billion more than initially planned. A restructuring is necessary to carry out top 100 policy objectives and tasks the government planned to resolve over the next five years, as well as fuel efforts to fundamentally change the country's economic paradigm. The minister believes a paradigm shift will help resolve the chronic socio-economic issues of low growth and income polarization. With the exception of a handful of ministries, Kim said all other government departments will be subject to the restructuring, including the suspension of their projects with low returns. The finance chief also reiterated the importance of a fair economy, which will become the basis of boosting income and jobs. In this regard, he stressed the need to root out unfair business practices of large retailers, provide a legal framework to protect the rights of SMEs, and induce mutual growth among big and small firms. 
He said the government will expand the number of large retailers subject to stricter regulations and come up with a comprehensive set of measures to protect technology rights and subcontractors. Kim says strict real estate controls unveiled last week appear to be cooling the overheated housing market, but officials will keep monitoring the situation in case additional measures are needed to limit property speculation. The minister also said the government will be rolling out new measures later this month to tackle Korea's massive household debt, amounting to more than 1.2 trillion U.S. dollars. Kim ji Business Daily. It appears the government's creative economy initiative is beginning to bear some fruit in the form of jobs. A new report on the results of state funding released by the Ministry of SMEs and Startups showed startups receiving government support were creating jobs more than five times faster than the average firm. The study of nearly 13,000 startup firms on government support between 2009 and 2015 showed employment rose by an average of more than 19 percent annually. This is much higher compared to the 3.6 percent for regular SMEs and 3.3 percent for conglomerates. It also showed startups were seeing the highest growth in sales as well. Average annual revenues for state-funded startups came to an equivalent of 446,000 U.S. dollars, growing at an average of 21 percent every year. A country where its citizens don't have to worry about hefty medical bills. This is the vision President Moon Jae-in has for Korea with the aim to achieve it by 2022. The Ministry of Health and Welfare announced a new plan this afternoon to boost Korea's health care provisions. It expanded coverage to most medical procedures, including MRIs and ultrasounds, but excluded those related to aesthetics and beauty. Pushing forward a budget of nearly $27 billion, the plan adds support for low-income households and patients in long-term care, as well as the growing elderly population. With the runaway success of Korea's two internet-only banks, K-Bank and Kakao Bank, are quickly becoming the market disruptors that financial authorities had hoped for. But it's also raising concerns over the country's growing household debt burden. Our Eunice Kim explains. Some 1.5 million accounts were created with Kakao Bank within a week of its launch. And with users clawing onto its competitive rates, more than 490 billion won in loans were issued by the consortium fronted by Korea's most popular messaging app. Add to this the 630 billion won in borrowing approved by K-Bank, open for business since April. That's a combined household loan sum exceeding 1 trillion won, coming to about 996 million U.S. dollars. Bypassing the bank branch is the best part. The electronic verification is inconvenient, so being able to bank without it is a big plus. Along with the hype, Korea's new direct banks also offer some competitive lending rates. Kakao Bank's lowest rate offered on its overdraft account is at 2.85 percent per year, a fraction of market offerings. Its rival, K-Bank, saw 70 percent of its lending go via its employee credit loan at an exceptional rate of 2.67 percent per annum. And major brick-and-mortar banks aren't sitting idly by, pushing out products that make borrowing easier to block an exodus of customers. KB Kungmin Bank is offering up to 50 million won in loans without ID for a choice group of customers. Shinhan Bank countered with an option that allows users to take out up to 100 million won via their mobile app, while Udi Bank has rolled out a mid-interest rate loan via its mobile-only Weebi Bank app. As financial authorities look to have succeeded in giving the sleepy banking industry a much-needed shot in the arm, there are also calls for some balancing, especially as it relates to Korea's $1.2 trillion debt pile. It's easy money, so borrow first, ask later. This type of thinking is very dangerous and will contribute to a further bloating of household debt. While there is a cap to how much these internet-only banks can lend out, K-Bank and Kakao Bank are both set to join the mortgage market, which means their lending capacity could expand within the year. This, as the new chairman of the country's top financial regulator, Che chong is set to announce a comprehensive plan on managing household debt before the month is up. Eunice Kim, Business Daily. 
It's been 13 days since Korea's second internet-only lender, Kakao Bank, opened its doors for business, but it has already garnered more than 2 million users. KeyBank, the country's first online exclusive lender, has also enjoyed huge popularity since its launch in April. To find out how these newcomers are changing the landscape of the banking sector here in Korea, we have our Oh Soo-young joining us in the studio today. Hi Soo-young. Hi Soo-young. All right, so the concept of this branchless bank is still quite new here in Korea. So how, what have these banks brought to the table? Well, brick and mortar banks have been providing mobile services for quite some time, tapping into Korea's advanced IT infrastructure. But KBank and Kakao Bank have taken the country by storm with unprecedented low borrowing rates and also user friendly access to commonly used services. These include money transfers, setting up savings and deposit accounts, as well as taking out loans. Kakao Bank's ultimate competitive advantage is that it is based on the platform of Kakao Talk, the nation's number one mobile messaging app. And of course, there is the fun factor. Kakao Bank's trademark characters on debit cards, for instance, and offering coupons for digital services as a form of interest in the case of KBank. While traditional banks saw the creation of 155,000 new accounts through its mobile services last year, it only took KBank 100 days after its launch to reach 400,000 customers, while Kakao Bank hit 1 million in less than a week. Now, I imagine traditional banks are quite worried about these newcomers on the scene. So how have they responded and are the traditional brick and mortar banks under threat? While well, the launch of the two branches bank certainly caused a splash in the market, followed by a significant ripple effect. Brick and mortar banks are now scrambling to improve their mobile services and make them more user friendly. They are also adjusting transaction fees and interest rates on individual loans and savings accounts to match those of Kakao Bank and KBank. A number of banks have also cut down on the number of branches and staff members. While the newcomers have stirred winds of change in the industry, experts say in the long run, traditional lenders won't be taken down so easily. Traditional banks will likely maintain their advantage in the market, given the sheer size of their assets, the trust and experience they've built over the years and investment in their own mobile banking systems, as well as security programs, so they can catch up or even outmatch internet-only banks, interest rates or services. It's been about two decades since internet-only banks first launched in the U.S. and Japan, yet they only take up about 4% and 2% of their respective banking sectors, even in the U.S. where banking regulations are more supportive of new ventures. In fact, whether the low-fee and high-interest model can be sustained has also been called into question. As seen in the U.S. where a lot of banks failed, Price competition alone cannot make banks profitable. Rather, low prices are an entry strategy to attract customers for new players in the market. In order to stabilize and grow, Internet banks must develop new services based on the needs of individual customers and charge the appropriate fees thereafter. So rather than pushing each other out of competition, I guess they will be taking on different roles and target different customers. Yes, that does seem to be the general consensus. Brick and mortar banks are likely to handle large sums of money and wealthy clients, as well as services that require more human interaction. Meanwhile, branches banks will continue to facilitate convenient, small scale services and also work as test spares of innovative features and financial mechanisms. IT and social media firms have substantial growth potential as their networks are in sync with the everyday lives of their customers. They can make use of data collected from lifestyle patterns and expand their existing services. You can send money through KakaoTalk messages, for instance. As smaller businesses, branchless banks need to find their niche. KT Corporation, for instance, has linked its own online music streaming services with KBank and determines its users' credit rating using big data. All right then, then what are some of the challenges that they face down the line? Well, the most critical task at hand is procuring more capital to back their businesses. This is already a major issue of concern for both banks. KBank, for instance, halted its loan package for salaried workers after just three months due to its soaring loan to asset ratio. Kakao Bank is also seeing its amount of extended loans close to matching its total of savings and deposits. Experts say the current banking regulations on ownership and control has severely limited the inflow of investment, which in turn affects the scale of operations. 
Korea's banking law aims to separate corporate interests from banking by allowing corporate entities to hold no more than a 10% stake in commercial banks and 4% of voting power in the boardroom. If these regulations are loosened, a major shareholding company could take initiative in making vast investments as well as implementing new business ideas. Experts say the expansion of internet-only banks could introduce diversity of products and services, which will ultimately benefit the industry as a whole, and most of all the customers. In the era of forced industrial revolution, the source of growth is innovation. The regulatory framework should support those with the technological and innovative capacity to introduce diverse, differentiated services that also reflect the demands of the market. However, it may take some time to see any legal changes, as there is opposition to loosening the stakeholding limits. So for now, experts say the two branchless banks' top priority should be stabilising their businesses, which could take three to five years, as well as managing initial overhead costs and ensuring sound debt collection. Banks must also prepare for crisis management on data protection as well as unexpected problems that could occur, such as compensating customers when there are security breaches or transaction errors. Well, I mean, it's still in its early stages, right? So I guess we can look forward to some exciting developments in Korea's banking sector. That's right. All right, thank you so much for coming in today. You're very welcome. For a brief look at today's stock market action, we have our markets contributor, Jemmy Kim, joining us on the line. Hello, Jemmy. Hello. All right, so how do Korean equities perform today, and what can we expect for the remainder of this week? Well, Korean stocks took a hit today over growing geopolitical concerns on the Korean Peninsula. Overnight losses on Wall Street also affected investor sentiment, sending the cost down 1.1% to end at 2368.39 points today. The tech-heavy cost stock closed 1.35% lower, to finish at 642.87 points. The main index opened lower this morning on worries over the intensifying war of words between North Korea and the U.S., with President Donald Trump threatening the regime with some fiery remarks. For the rest of this week, there doesn't seem to be too many events in store that could keep the index afloat. On Thursday, there's a speech scheduled by New York Fed President William Dudley, and on Friday, the heads of the Minneapolis and Dallas Feds will also be taking to the podium. They aren't expected to deviate too far from the current FOMC stance, although important clues on the central bank's policy direction could come when the U.S. releases its inflation figures for, for July, which is also on Friday. This has been Jemmy Kim for Business Daily. Samsung Electronics smartphone market share in Japan has hit a four-year high thanks to strong sales of its Galaxy 8 handsets. According to market research firm Strategy Analytics, Samsung sold 700,000 handsets from April to June, good enough for third place in the Japanese market. Samsung's market share in the country reached 8.8 percent in the second quarter, more than double the 3.8 percent seen in Q1. Samsung's share of the global market came to 23.3% in the first quarter, widening its gap with runner-up Apple, which came in at 14.7%. However, with the iPhone 8 on the horizon, Samsung's gains in Japan and in the global market is expected to be short-lived. Korea's leisure aviation is still very much in a starting stage, but playing catch-up is something Koreans have a knack for. Now this year, a two-seater light aircraft was developed, and 80% of it was made using homegrown technology. With more on the technological breakthrough, as well as the obstacles to clear for the industry to take flight, here's our Oh Jung-hee. Flying high into the sky and looking down on the earth below, it's a dream that many have fantasized about in the past. Flight has come a long way since the Wright brothers first took to the skies over a hundred years ago. And with rising incomes across the globe, more and more people dream of flying their own airplanes as private pilots. The United States and a few European countries are leading the light aircraft market. The industry is just getting started in Korea. Though the country exports its T-50 supersonic jet, one of the world's few trainer jets, it hadn't produced any aircraft for personal use. But this year, a two-seater light aircraft was fully developed for the first time in Korea and is now having test flights. 
It's been a long seven year journey for Korean researchers, firms and the government to develop this aircraft, KLA-100. The plane is already drawing lots of attention due to its cutting edge technology and relatively low price. The aircraft can fly at maximum speed of 245 kilometers per hour for up to six hours. Its body is made of a light carbon composite, and the plane is equipped with an automatic flight control system and digitalized instrument panel, all made with homegrown Korean technology. There is also a parachute for safe landing in emergencies. The plane will set you back around 130,000 U.S. dollars, relatively cheap, with similar aircraft costing around 160,000 dollars. Up to 80 percent of the plane's technology is purely Korean technology, mainly used for the control system, landing gears and hardware. Of course, there are other aircraft with similar strengths as ours in the market already, but they're expensive. Ours has a strong price competitiveness. Usually, it's just ordinary people with licenses who want to enjoy leisure sports or personal traveling that fly light aircraft. Pilot Yoon Sang says the aircraft is very sophisticated and agile, easy to learn for beginners. Before I come to uh, join this uh, project, I flew uh, Cessna 172 and also a uh, small plane like uh, Eurostar. But to compare uh, to those uh, airplanes, uh, this plane is uh, very easy, easy to fly, that means easy to learn. It's very uh, good for the, especially for the beginners. KLA-100 was developed to satisfy rising demand in Korea as well as to be sold overseas, mainly to China and Southeast Asia and ultimately to America and Europe. The aircraft is expected to boost the local economy by over 10 million U.S. dollars and create 2,000 jobs. Its development is not only significant in that it's Korea's very first commercialized plane, but also in that it'll enable the development of other fourth industrial revolution technologies. The KLA-100 can serve as a testbed for many technologies Korea wants to develop, like electric planes or unmanned aircraft. This is very important because if we buy and use planes from other countries, it's difficult to test new technologies as we don't have much data on the plane itself. Since 2014, the Korean government is carrying out projects to stimulate the leisure aviation industry, and regional governments are establishing airstrips. The country hopes to expand its aviation technology to ultimately produce larger airplanes in the future. Korea's technology was a bit too weak to produce large airplanes, so we chose to start with light aircraft, the entry barrier of which is relatively lower. Now with the KLA-100, the basic infrastructure is set up to finally develop 50-seater airplanes in the future. The creation of the KLA-100 is the culmination of what many in the industry have long dreamed of. But at the same time, it's only the start of a new breakthrough in Korea's aviation industry and the beginning of another journey to develop aircraft using 100% Korean technology. Oh Jung-hee, Business Daily. And that wraps it up for today. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more at the same time, same place for your business daily. Until then, goodbye.